Fantastic. Thank you so much, Scott. That was great. Next up, we have Jeffrey Townsend, and he is a professor of biostatistics and ecology and evolutionary biology at the Yale School of Public Health at Yale University. He's also the co-organizer of the SMBE satellite meeting on the molecular biology and evolution cancer, evolution of cancer at the Yale School of Public Health. And today he's going to be speaking about the somatic molecular evolution of cancer, mutation, selection, and epistasis. Welcome, Jeff. You simply need to unmute. There you go. Yeah, there we go. Thanks. Just waiting for my uh, unmute to come up. Um, I see my presentation is up, so I'll go ahead and start. Um, yes, thank you very much for the great introduction. I'm really pleased that everyone is attending this conference. I think it's an incredibly important topic that we all need to think about carefully in terms of um, ensuring that we develop a community that uh, will um, will move this uh, conceptual the conceptual advances that we've talked about today and we'll be talking about for the next couple of days forward. And I'll end my talk talking a little bit about that. Um, as uh, Tamara mentioned, um, uh, I have worked on cancer evolution for a little while and, and very recently have been involved in a meeting, which I'll talk about today. Uh, so I have a sort of two purposes in the talk I'm going to give today. One is to convey some of the work that um, my group has been doing, but maybe an even bigger and more important point is to try to convey some of the results of the meeting that we had about a year ago um, in April, uh, uh, talking about the molecular evolution and biology of cancer and thinking about what the next steps we need to take in that direction are in order to ensure that um, evolutionary concepts are incorporated into how we study cancer. Uh, so let me just start by sort of um, advancing my own slides to um, to point out that there was this conference was uh, put together actually by myself and my co-organizer Jason Somarelli at Duke University. Um, I have to thank him for an enormous amount of work he did in putting it together as well. Uh, and the point was we just really wanted to bring to attention the uh, the things that molecular evolutionary theory had to contribute to understanding cancer evolution. Um, his cancer evolution is sort of not really sat in the center of any discipline, which is one of the reasons why we're having this meeting. And I think it's really important that as, as we think through where we go, we incorporate lots of different and diverse opinions into the formation of ideas for cancer evolution to make a productive uh, group who uh, really support each other in studying this uh, kind of research. We had a, quite a number of speakers who are listed down here, and so um, all of them deserve some credit, as well as all the attendees who all contributed to the things that I'm going to uh, point out at the highest level with regard to um, the evolution of cancer. So just to skip to the main points, um, uh, here's the, we actually wrote a paper uh, describing our sort of the consensus view that came out of this uh, 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 talk. We fortunately had a situation where at that time we could meet in person. I know we would love to be doing that right now, but that meant that we had a, a number of opportunities and we set aside quite a lot of time for individual discussions and actually group discussions and group breakouts in order to try to come to some sort of consensus about what the current challenges in understanding cancer are and in particular what the contributions that molecular evolutionary biology could uh, make toward uh, cancer evolution. And so this was the summary that we came up with in the end uh, of the questions that we asked and the answers that we gave about where we need to go. Um, so one question was, how can classical molecular evolutionary studies inform cancer discovery? And we wanted to bring, up, bring forward a couple things that we felt were under, uh, under examined. One is that study of genotype by inter environment interactions is well established in evolutionary biology and can be applied to understand the molecular consequences of cancer tissue microenvironment. Uh, we can also apply established evolutionary paradigms to elucidate the inheritance of cancer uh, predisposing alleles in the somatic, uh, sorry, in the germline evolution of cancer. Uh, another one is that the ha classical hallmarks of cancer and cancer, cancer fitness landscapes have not been integrated in a coherent way and uh, seems like a major task for us to do as evolutionary biologists to look at all of um, Hanahan and Weinberg's classic uh, hallmarks of cancer and basically say, how did these coordinate with the evolution of cancer itself? Those are obviously phenotypes, uh, but understanding the underlying genotypes and how they link to those phenotypes is a key uh, advancement that has not been made and probably could be. Uh, furthermore, understanding the cell identity and tissue context at the same time 
and looking at temporal occurrence and the epistatic interactions between different mutations, uh, how they dictate selection on hallmark phenotypes, and how they affect the order of mutations and the manifestation of cancer in every patient. A third area was that we, uh, we want to know how we can build molecular evolutionary models of cancer's special characters. So evolutionary biologists have for many years worked on sequence evolution and how individual single nucleotide mutations uh, have changed over time. And indeed, in my own work, that's what I have focused on because that's what I know so well, because that's what we've developed really, really sophisticated models to address. Uh, but cancer has a lot of special characters, uh, some of which have been very, very uh, eloquently described by James Shapiro uh, and others, um, Henry Hang and others today. Uh, and those special characters need to be considered within a framework of evolutionary theory so that we understand what their effect on the evolution of cancer is. And so the question is, how can we build models that are outside of what evolutionary biological models actually have already done so far that can take into account cancer's special characters? Uh, listed below here are loss of heterozygosity and copy number variation, which is a very broad territory, obviously, but incorporates the kinds of uh, karyotypic and chromosomal and individual gene level uh, copy number variation. Um, and epigenetics as well, which could be quite plastic and not necessarily heritable in the direct sense, but in, in a long term, in a short term sense, it has some heritability. Uh, all of these require consideration of the stability and the range and the, for, in order to create evolutionary models. We also need a lot of multi-region and temporal sampling to try to understand the evolution of cancer. So we were advocating for multi-omic kind of studies like uh, Charles Swanton talked about uh, um, in his work on lung cancer yesterday. And also clearly paralyzed model systems that are essential resources for evolutionary study. Um, and then the last point is a very broad one, which I'll end with in my talk, which is just that how do we bring together these diverse areas and keep communicating? Obviously, this is not a formed field. And what that means is that there's a lot of different communication aspects that um, need to be smoothed over. People use different language. Uh, people are advocates for their own particular you know, concerns. Um, but we, what we need to really be is concerned for each other as much as we're concerned for ourselves. If we try to advocate just for one side in, in sort of one or one component of, the, of this story, um, that will not be what brings about the revolution that we want in terms of rooting for cancer evolution into uh, therapeutic and clinical applications in order to, uh, to, um, to make uh, the situation of individuals who have cancer uh, better. Um, so what we need to do is support each other at the same time as we advance our own research in each area. All right, so that's the broad view. Um, and now I'm going to spend a little bit of time di diving into just a few examples of each of these uh, from other people's work and my own. Um, so looking at how can classical molecular evolutionary studies inform cancer discovery, I'm going to start with some work that actually built on my PhD research, which was the first study to look at genome-wide gene expression variation, and I used yeast to do that. I had a um, graduate student um, who uh, was very interested in understanding adaptive topographies, topographies for a character um, selected in different environments. And the key thing is that different environments, as evolutionary biologists have often argued, uh, have different evolutionary landscapes, right? So we bring one genetic type into one evolutionary landscape and bring it into another. Uh, there's a different evolutionary process that happens for each of them. And this is just a, a diagram example, a topo map. Um, in these kinds of uh, diagrams, these are just Z and Z1 and Z2 are just two different phenotypes of any description. Um, and the point is that how you navigate this map, if it's an evolutionary landscape, you might be selected up to the peak immediately here. Um, if, on, if you're in a different environment, you might be selected in a very different pattern to the same exact peak. Um, and you may have different peaks actually in different environments as well. So it's very important to understand these kinds of uh, adaptive topographies. And I think they provide us the opportunity to do what was talked about by Bob Gatton B earlier, the ability to sort of look at this as a dynamic process where we can inform it at the same time as we actually, uh, as we actually decide what to do therapeutically for patients. It's a long-term goal, uh, but one I think we really need to aspire for and one which this group of people is particularly suited toward uh, developing um, uh, act, uh, you know, effective approaches towards. All right, so that, stu undergrad that uh, graduate student of mine uh, went on to study not just variation among individuals in genetic variation in uh, gene expression differences, but gene by environment interactions that are abundant in natural systems. In this case, it's Saccharomyces cerevisiae in copper environments, which is not terribly relevant to the cancer directly. But the point is that um, we looked at sort of the, the um, uh, 
fitness viable landscape of levels of copper. And copper is a particularly interesting one because at very, at very low levels, it's a, it's a nutrient. In other words, you need certain amounts of copper, but at high levels, it's a toxin. So there's this intermediate range, which is actually essentially describing the range that the organism actually experiences it in the wild of when it is fit and when it is not based on uh, level of copper. And by looking across this range of copper and looking at gene expression differences, and this connects to um, uh, the discussion earlier about gene expression, um, although this is bulk sampling, not individual cells. The point is that looking across this range of uh, copper environments and each one of these uh, sets of columns is that range, higher copper at the wide end of this triangle, less copper at the lower end of that copper. What you can see is that there are a number of genes that follow a simple genetic uh, relationship. That is, if you look at these natural strains of Saccharomyces, they have some genes uh, all being expressed essentially the same way, depending only on the genetics and the environment doesn't make any difference. So we see a few of those that are cla uh, ca classified as sort of G, genetic differences. Um, we actually see very few that are purely environmental, very few genes that are responding just because the environment is one way or another words. And low copper or high copper, in some cases, makes a complete difference based on genetics, but most of the time there's some sort of, uh, sorry, in com some cases makes a very big difference purely on environment and it doesn't matter what genetics you have, but in most cases there's G by E. In other words, most of the time, the genetic interaction that you actually see is a genetic interaction in which uh, the, um, the genes and the environment both matter for understanding what gene expression is. So this relates very closely to the discussion we had yesterday in the panel, which just points out, pointed out that we need to think both about that microenvironment of the tumor and about what goes on inside, because this is an example from organismal evolution, but I can, I can strongly argue <laughs> that the same is going to be true for tumors. Uh, they're going to have genetics that are very important, and there's going to have environmental differences that are very important. And thinking about them as one or the other is the wrong way to think about it. The way to think about it is, is as an interaction between the two. That makes our task even more complicated, but um, that's our route towards actually making progress in this field, if you ask me. Just to bring this to the point of cancer, Stephen Gaffney, who's an associate research scientist working in my group right now, uh, did a large study looking at gene expression in the tumor marker environment, looking at many, 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 many tissues. Um, each, of, each of the uh, columns across here is one cancer tissue, and each of the rows in this is a single gene in that cancer tissue. And the point simply was to look at the immune microenvironment, um, deconvolve the particular gene expression of different uh, genes that that are typically um, immune-related genes that might be checkpoints. And we were looking in particular here at, um, at checkpoints that might be complementary to PD-1 and CTLA-4, the two checkpoint inhibitors that are currently in widespread use in cancer and have provided such exciting results in recent years. And the point would be what we really want to find in the gene expression of the T cells that are in the environment of the tumor is we want to find T cells that have an expression of a checkpoint inhibitor that is not PD-1 and not CTLA-4, but is something else. And the point would be, if we can find that, that might be the next target to use, because it might be the one that treats those patients who cannot currently be treated by pd one or by CTLA-4 inhibitor th th um, uh, therapies. So this is what we did. We looked across the entire genome for that. And one of the, uh, there's, you know, there's two points I just want to make from this. One is that we saw a lot of candidates that had widespread gene hygiene expression across multiple tumor types. So I think there's a really good, uh, this just made me feel very encouraged that there is some potential to develop um, other in in inhibitor therapies that will be helpful um, on the immune level. Um, you can see CD2, TIGID, and CD27, which are three genes that are very highly targeted right now, but there's a number of many others here um, on the left and on the right. Uh, Tar uh, genes that um, people believe may be uh, strong targets for immunotherapy. So it takes a long time to design these um, inhibitors. Um, so it'll be some time before they come out, but there's quite the potential for a broad uh, suite of inhibitors developed. And these kinds of um, understanding of the gene expression in the environment, as well as of the genetics, is very important for our best uh, uh, opportunities in uh, cancer therapy. Okay, so. Um, Let's go on to the second challenge, um, if I have a little enough time for it. Um, what I want to talk about next is just 
how uh, the hallmarks of cancer landscape can add up. And this is maybe the core of the kind of research that I'm really working on. I think it's very important for us to understand the landscape of an individual patient evolving with cancer therapy as kind of a fitness landscape. Fitness landscape is an analogy. I don't mean it's exact. I just mean thinking about what the trajectory of that patient is over time, just like Bob Gattenby talked about earlier. Um, and so what, what's important to understand is that um, uh, in the last 10 years or so, there's been an enormous amount of cancer genomics uh, studies, which is, their goal has largely been to find the gene that causes cancer. Um, there are some issues with that sort of conception that I want to talk about, and I'll talk about one of them right now, not all of them, but, uh, but the one thing that I want to just discuss is um, underlying this has been the idea that mutation frequency is really, really important. In other words, you look at the number of mutations in each of these cancers, and I just want, you know, one thing to make a clear point about is different different tumors within each cancer have vastly different amounts of mutation <laughs> and different tumors across tumors have vastly different amounts of mutation. So these two things tell you that there's an enormous amount of variation in underlying mutation. And so just looking at the rates of mutation themselves um, purely on their own doesn't really tell you what you need to know about the evolution of cancer because clearly there's very different ways that cancer can evolve. And maybe there's only Maybe there's in just a few ways, but there's certainly a lot of noise if there are just a few ways. So how can we sort of get past all these mutate, high mutation rates and get an understanding of evolution of cancer? And one of the insights that I think was really critical early on was one by Lawrence et al. in 2013, which was that mutation rate varies widely across the genome and correlates with DNA replication time and expression level. Here you can see these lines just indicating the number of, of synonymous mutations seen at different locations in the genome based on uh, replication time and gene expression. Um, and uh, I won't go through the details of this, but these covariates with gene expression, uh, I don't have time to go through the whole slide, just to point out that the mutations per megabase is lower with high gene expression due to transcription-enabled repair. Uh, the mutations per megabase is higher with late replication time compared to early replication time. Uh, and so those covariates can help us to understand what the underlying mutation rates of individual genes are. And that turns out to be really essential to the calculation of p-values for whether a gene, as, again, is mutated in a, in a genome. So what you see here is a 2014 paper by Lawrence et al., which emphasizes two things. Uh, it emphasizes that the, um, uh, what you see on this axis, the x-axis, is the gene p-value, so whether or not it is highly significantly overburdened with mutations more than you'd expect. And so if, it's, if you see in tumors a lot more mutations than you'd expect simply by mutation rate, then you, would, um, then you would think it's probably related to the development of cancer. And, and that's absolutely right. And then the other thing that they convey with these lollipops at the top, both by color and size of the dot, is the prevalence. That is how many uh, in your cohort of, say, 100 patients or more than that, how many of them actually uh, exhibit a mutation in that particular gene. And so generally, there's a correlation between prevalence and uh, p-value, but it is not exact. For instance, here are some low prevalence genes that have very high p-values because their muta underlying mutation rate is quite low, but that you still, still see them at reasonably high frequency. This is all great, but it's actually missing um, the most important factor here, right? Because what's missing here? Uh, Biostats 101 tells you that p-value is not a measure of effect. In other words, you can't take p-value to tell you how important these are to cancer. Um, and prevalence is also not a measure of effect. Prevalence is just the patient population that is subject to that particular mutation. So in order to get at uh, the effect, what you need to do is deconvolve that prevalence into what was caused by that particular mutation and what wasn't. So to quantify cancer effect size, prevalence has to be deconvolved into the baseline mutation rate um, and, and the degree of selection in the cancer mutation lineage. I probably don't need to go through this. The main point is that we have variation in selection and mutation and uh, selection both produce differential amounts of mutation. What we were able to do with Vincent Canataro, who uh, is, uh, was in my group and has now got an independent position, is to look at gene by gene what the mutation rates are. That's using the same apparatus as for that p-value, but pulling out those mutation rates specifically then looking at site by site at what the mutation rates are based on a trinucleotide context, and then combining those two and running them through the genetic code to actually make a site by site prediction for what the neutral rate of evolution of genes would be. In other words, how often would we see a tyrosine at 850 histine in uh, EGFR? 
uh, a histidine at the same site, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is the diagram of the rate at which we expect all of those things to change. And the point is, we don't see that kind of change. We see a very, very reduced representation of those kinds of things. That's the evidence of natural selection for those mutations in causing cancer. Otherwise, we'd have exactly the same distri distribution of changes here and changes here. Um, and so the point is that the, these mutations that we see at high frequency when we actually sequence are the mutations that are causing, uh, that are, are mutations that are causative of cancer. There may be many other things too, exactly what the distribution of other things is, is not displayed by this kind of analysis. Um, and so I just want to quickly sort of point out that then you can look at the mean rate for every given site for within every given gene. That's displayed on the right here, along with the prevalence in this number in the middle of the number of tumors that have that particular gene. And what you'll see is sometimes there are uh, genes that are uh, particular mutations at very high prevalence, such as G12C. This is in lung cancer, lung adenocarcinoma. Um, very high prevalence, but it also has a high mutation rate because the G12C mutation is actually one of the ones that's particularly likely to be caused by smoking. And then you can actually calculate by deconvolving, by dividing out essentially that mutation rate, what the relative impact of those mutations are. And we can see that all of these G12 mutations have very high, uh, relatively equivalently very high mutation uh, selection intensities. EGFR also has a very high selection intensity, BRAF, et cetera. This is the cancer effect on the right. This is the amount at which, to which a particular gene is actually contributing to the evolution of cancer and is vitally important to understanding and interpreting the kind of data we've been analyzing for the ten, last 10 years, but where we haven't reported this once in any of those papers, only in the papers that I've done subsequently sort of analyze, reanalyzing that kind of data. So uh, what can this kind of explain? Well, for instance, here are, um, here are the distribution of G, those G12 mutations in pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer. Here's the G12C mutation. And there's been a lot of speculation about whether there's something special about lung tissue, which is why G12C is so common. Is it especially effective at causing cancer? And the answer is no, it isn't. It's, uh, it's actually uh, the lowest of the four different ones there, or a pro almost the lowest of the four different ones there. So it's the same in all th three of these cancers. It's just caused a lot more because of smoking. Um, so those kinds of interpretations are important. You get very different distributions for different uh, cancers. So this is lung squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and you can calculate this for any sufficiently large subset or subset of tumors. So here are 23 different cancers, the major drivers and what exactly their selection intensity for each of these mutations is. Up on the upper right, you see BRAF mutations. That's the one that is treated by the melanoma uh, drug that was shown earlier, uh, I believe it was by Anna, uh, Anna, Anna Barker. Um, you can see it's got tremendously high selection intensity, which is a, sort of a big indicator that if you had a good therapy, it would work tremendously well like it does. Although it doesn't tell you, of course, as Anna pointed out, uh, how likely you are to evolve resistance subsequently, which is apparently the major problem with the BRAF inhibitor is the evolution of resistance, the rapid evolution of resistance. All right, you can characterize the full distribution across all the different uh, changes that happen of all of these mutations across lots of different cancer types. So we really understand understand the baseline, like what are these genetic changes and how much effect they have. That is a known fact from these kinds of analyses. So I see a lot in papers, people saying, we don't know yet what the selection coefficients for these are. We do, <laughs> it's all known. <laughs> so um, now we just need to do, uh, to expand this, to incorporate not just these single nucleotide mutations, which as uh, James and others today have emphasized are one part of the cancer story and maybe not even the major part, who knows? We need to try to understand it for uh, copy number variation, karyotypes, et cetera, et cetera. All right, now, but what is this, this cancer effect is really important for lots of different areas. It's important for basic research. We should be studying in basic research, those things that have, have high cancer effects. For precision medicine, you could use this in tumor boards right now when you have two mutations uh, that are all both indicated for a drug for a different type of uh, uh, cancer where you can actually prescribe it to the patient, but you don't know which one to use prescribe the patient, the patient the drug that treats uh, the mutation that has the higher cancer effect size in that particular cancer. You can use it to guide your clinical trials. We don't have, we can't do every clinical trial in the world, but we can do the ones that are indicated to have high cancer effect. And you can use it in pharmaceutical development by prioritizing the development of drugs to those targets that have high effect. I got like almost no time left. So I just want to very quickly say um, that we want to also understand how epigenetic changes and diverse CNVs, that's what I meant, pointed out, um, contribute to, um, to cancer. 
uh, how they all add up to a landscape sort of view where they all add up one by one to lead to cancer, or maybe there's tremendously important, um, you know, giant cell evolution, or there's tremendously important uh, karyotypic chaos. All of these things need to be sort of understood in their temporal context, what they do to the, the other ones, and how much each one points relative to the other. And the baseline understanding we have to get is how frequently they occur on their own and what the selective impact on those is. All right. So uh, just a summary again, these are the current challenges to understanding cancer. And the very last one I want to emphasize is, um, if I just skip forward because I'm running out of time, uh, is that um, all of these hallmarks are incorporated in cancer effect. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, genome instability and mutation is really um, a key factor that really needs to be separated from all the others because how you get that gene instability, either due to mutations, as Ken Pienta mentioned, or due to um, the uh, environmental changes changing the genome instability mutation, that works differently from all these others, which are phenotypes of cancer themselves. Uh, I just want to emphasize that we can actually look at the change of evolution of these tumors over time uh, using evolutionary approaches directly on tumor tissues so we can create phylogenies, understand the evolution of mutation patterns and particular mutations that lead to resistance. I'd love to talk about this more with other people. Um, don't have time right now to talk about it through. And the only thing I have else to say beyond this is that we really need to bring areas together, uh, keep this group communicating. These molecular evolutionary paradigms need to be a component of clinical treatment uh, considerations. These evolutionary biologists, clinicians, and everybody who has some insight into how this is a process of evolution over time, uh, we all need to communicate and support each other in building this community because a community that works to uh, enhance its diversity and its uh, ideas across different disciplinary boundaries is going to do very, very well in the current climate and one that doesn't won't do well. So I really encourage everyone to think carefully on how we can support each other moving forward to make cancer and evolution an area where we see dramatic advances over time in multiple areas uh, of our very, fairly large domain. Thanks for your time, and um, I'll move on, move on for questions if we have any time for it, which probably we don't. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, uh, Jeffrey. Um, uh, I, I had one question, which I think I saw in, in one of the last slides you showed, which is how many longitudinal studies has there been? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. I think it's a really important thing to do. Um, so in 2016, I wrote a paper that was published in KNAS, which had the first uh, sort of cancer chronogram in it. Uh, had actually 40 different cancer chronograms where we actually timed uh, and lined up with clinical annotations of what was happening to the patients for, for approximately 40 patients. Um, what happens in, the, in their clinical time course and what happened in their genetic evolution and at the same time uh, tried to project what driver mutations were occurring, whether they're occurring early or late or how it was occurring. So those, um, that's one um, area where we did some work. Charles Swanton has done some other work in this as well. Um, so far, most of the work actually looking at those chronograms, if that's what you're asking about, has still been going on in my group. The ones I just briefly flashed up there are unpublished work that we're going to publish soon. But I think it's actually really important to connect these on a temporal time scale. And the classic evolutionary approaches that people have used to do time, temporal time scales actually work in this case. They require a little bit of tweaking, but they're incredibly effective. And I'm really excited about the prospect for understanding different things. I mean, I only had a moment, I'm running out of time, but I'll just mention that in that example, there was a great example, which I can't show because of lack of time right now, but um, uh, you can actually see that the cisplatin therapy that was used earlier probably produced the underlying mutations that then uh, created the EGFR erlotinib mutation that then gave resistance to erlotinib. So the idea of the dynamic evolution of cancer over the cl clinical time course of a patient it's not just an idea. We can see the, you know, the molecular footprints of exactly this happening in a real time sense. I mean, it's not real time, it's past time, but we can really see it. We can track it so that it's really undeniably happening. Uh, we can see it and we can talk about exactly what the best trajectories for us to use therapies are and what therapies are gonna actually work counter to our own interests by doing that kind of cancer chronogram and understanding what the temporal evolution of cancer 
uh, in for individual patients is. And ideally what we want to do is make predictions along the lines of what Bob Gattenby was talking about to the future that then can be used to guide therapeutic options in my view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, Tamara, I think we have to introduce the next speaker now.